At the end of the first half of this video lecture, I posed this question to you where you were pushing a box at a constant velocity across a floor, and I asked you what the rate of change of momentum of the box is, and I sort of tried to fool you by pointing out that you are pushing, and what you already know if you're doing this through Moodle is that the rate of change of momentum is zero. Note, the box is moving with constant velocity, and its inertia certainly isn't changing, and so its momentum isn't changing. So the rate of change of momentum is zero. But you are exerting a force on the box, and we've defined force as the rate of change of momentum. The reason this can happen is that the force you are exerting on the box isn't the only force exerted on it. So you're pushing forward on the box, but the box is also interacting with the floor. And you probably know, if you think about it for a moment, that there will be a frictional force back on the box due to the floor. The fact that the box is moving at constant velocity tells us that the strength of these two forces, the one that you're exerting on the box and the one that the floor is exerting on the box, must be equal. And so the vector sum of the forces is zero, and that's why the rate of change of the momentum is zero. You could, of course, push harder. And what you would expect, and you'd be right, is that if you push harder, the box is going to start speeding up. In other words, its rate of change of momentum is going to be a vector pointing forward. Now the vector sum looks like this, with the big forward pointing vector by u, the smaller backward pointing vector due to the floor pointing back, and the vector sum here pointing forward. Or, of course, you could push less hard. Now the box will slow down, and the vector sum of forces points back. What this shows us is that our definition of force as the rate of change of the object's momentum isn't quite good enough. It's fine when we have a situation where there's only one force acting on the object that matters. But as soon as there's more than one, we need the vector sum of the forces, not just one force. And so our definition is that the vector sum of all the forces exerted on an object equals the rate of change of the object's momentum with respect to time. This means we can set up situations where we know there's only one force that matters acting on an object, and we can measure its rate of change of momentum and use that as a measurement of the force. But in most situations, objects have more than one force acting on them that are causing the rate of change of momentum. I've already stated that forces always come in pairs, and this is related to the fact that interactions are always between pairs of objects. But let's see how experiment shows us this, because it also shows something else to us about these pairs of forces. So let's think of our usual situation of two carts colliding. And if we just multiply the vx by t graph by each of the inertias, we get our momentum versus time graph. And we've already seen that interactions conserve momentum. And the way that plays out is that the change in momentum of the one object is always just the negative of the change in the momentum of the other object. So this is just conservation of momentum, and we've seen this plenty of times. So let's look at it in this experiment, where a fairly soft spring has been used as the interaction between the two carts. And so there is some time for the collision to take place, in this case about 0.25 seconds. We can now use our definition of force, in this case there's only one force that matters on these carts, and so we can find the average force that this spring is exerting on the carts by just doing a change in P over a change in T, right? That is a rate of change of the momentum. Well, if you just plug these numbers through, you find that the force that cart B is exerting on cart A must be 1.1 kilogram meters per second squared in the negative x direction. And the force by A on B must be exactly the same magnitude pointing in the other direction. Well, that exactly the same magnitude isn't a coincidence. Let's think about a stiffer spring. 
So the collision is going to be exactly the same other than that the soft spring has been replaced with a stiffer one. So in particular the inertias of these carts are the same and their initial velocities were the same. Well we still have to conserve momentum and if you look these collisions have been elastic so I'm going to leave it elastic and so we have to have the same final velocities. So the only difference is going to be the time for the collision to take place. And so our Vx versus T graph would look like this, where if you compare that with the previous one, the initial and final velocities of the carts are identical. All that's happened is that the collision time has reduced. And again, we can convert that into a momentum versus time graph, and we see the same changes in momentum as before. They come out exactly the same they have to, because for this elastic collision there's only one way those delta p's can come out. So the difference now is that the time of the collision is shorter. And so again, using our definition of force as rate of change of momentum, we get the force by b on a as now negative 3 kilogram meters per second squared, and the force by a on b as 3 kilogram meters per second squared. So they're about three times what they were with the soft spring, and that's because the time for the collision was cut in about a third. And again, we see that the force that one object exerts on the other is equal in magnitude to its partner in this interaction, and that they, op they act in opposite directions. This is a law. Whenever two objects interact, they exert forces on each other that are equal in magnitude and opposite in direction. The pair of forces that you get out of a single interaction are called an interaction pair. So we've seen examples of this. When you hit the mattress, the, the mattress exerted a force on you, which is what brought you to rest, and you exerted a force on the mattress, which compressed it. And what we've just seen is that these two forces must be in opposite directions and must be of the same magnitude. But the other thing to, um, to realize about interaction pairs that's always true is that they always act on two different objects. In this example, one of these forces is a force that the mattress exerts on you, whereas the other one is a force that you exert on the mattress. There's some language that's useful when talking about these interaction pairs of forces, and it's that forces have targets and agents. So remember, every interaction occurs between a pair of physical objects. So for example, the interaction between my hand and the wall, so the wall exerts a force on my hand and my, and the, and my hand exerts a force on the wall. Well, each force has to be exerted by some physical object, and likewise every force is exerted on some physical object. So looking at the force by my hand on the wall, we say that my hand is the agent of this force. It's the thing exerting the force. And likewise, the wall is what we would call the target of this force. But now if you look at the partner of this force, the other force that's part of this interaction, which is the force by the wall on my hand, now the wall is the agent of this force, and my hand is the target. So the agent and target get swapped when you go from one force to its partner, which is the other force in the same interaction. The language that we use here is important and can be very helpful, and I encourage you to use language quite carefully when you're talking about forces. You should make it clear whenever you're talking about a force what its agent is and what its target is. So we might say that Bender exerts a force on the steel beam. We're saying that Bender is the agent of this force, and the steel beam is the target of the force that we're talking about. Likewise, we could say that Stuart is pushing up on a banana, and so Stuart is the agent and the banana is the target. We could say this same thing by saying that there is a force on the banana due to Stuart. And there are various other phrases along these lines, but the phrases should make it clear what 
object, what physical thing is the agent of the force, and what other physical thing is the target of the force. Your first task, anytime you're trying to think about a situation using forces, is to identify all the forces that exist. And this isn't a trivial skill, it takes practice. Let's think about our two classes of interactions. We have contact interactions and long-range interactions. Well, contact interactions result in what we will call contact forces, and these happen any time two objects touch. And so identifying them isn't so hard, you just look for where things are touching other things. So for example, when I lean on the wall, I'm touching it, and so there's a pair of forces by my hand on the wall and by the wall on my hand. When you slam into the mattresses, there's a, an interaction, and so there's a pair of forces by you on the mattresses and by the mattresses on you. Similarly, if you pull a car using a rope, then the rope exerts a force on the car. The car also exerts a force back on the rope, which I haven't shown. When a boat is floating on the water, it's touching the water, and so there must be a force that the water is exerting on the boat, and likewise a force that the boat is exerting on the water. An airplane stays in the air because there is a force that the air is exerting on the plane, and of course that also means the plane must be exerting a force on the air. And you can speed up in a car because you can make the road push forward with a frictional force that acts on the car, and at the same time the car must be exerting a backwards frictional force on the road. Long-range interactions can be a little more subtle. We say they result in field forces. We could call them long-range forces, but I'm going to use the term field forces to set you up for the next course, Phys 1204, where we talk a lot about fields. These are forces that can act at a distance, and so because there's no contact, it's not always obvious when these forces are occurring. We need to look for their effects to see that they exist. So for example, when you drop masses, they accelerate downwards. That's because the Earth is gravitationally pulling on them. There's a force by the Earth on the mass, which is a gravitational force. Similarly, I was able to push magnets around using another magnet because there is a magnetic force that requires no contact. But just like the contact forces, these come in pairs. So because the magnet in my hand A exerts a force on the stack of magnets B, the stack of magnets B must exert a force back on the magnet in my hand A, and I can feel that force. Less obviously, when you drop the masses, or even if you don't drop them, there is this force by the Earth on the masses, and so the masses must also be pulling up on the Earth gravitationally. That may not be obvious, but we see its effect all the time. The Moon orbits the Earth because the Earth is pulling on the Moon gravitationally, and so the Moon pulls gravitationally back on the Earth, and we see that most obviously through the tides.